something about being a silly Aussie um, standing in front of an American audience, and I am one now, I've been a citizen for some time, but wasn't born here, like most of you, and something about being kind of a, a naive Aussie is I'm probably going to say some things, if I ever talk about America, I'm probably going to say some things that you already knew the whole of your life that, you know, I only just find out more recently. Um, so bear with me. I want to talk about the year 1814. In 1814, one of the most pivotal, pivotal, pivotal moments in American history it took place in Baltimore Harbour. Uh, in one of the key battles of the War of 1812. You know where I'm going? Who knows where I'm going? Yeah, 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 I thought so. Uh, just a month previously, what had happened was the British had invaded Washington, D.C. They had burned all the buildings, including the White House, and now British troops were poised in... Baltimore Harbour, and it had sights of taking the fort in Baltimore Harbour, Fort McHenry. Now, uh, in capturing Baltimore, it would be the capture at that time of one of the key financial and political territories in the United States. In taking this city, it would probably mean that British victory would happen in that war, and it may even mean a rewrite of what happened in the Revolutionary War except with a different outcome. Uh, I'm sure you learned this history in school. Did you learn this history in school? Yeah? Well, some people are shaking their head, no, good, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, okay? Because I didn't, and I, I read this history later in life, and I'm thinking, wow, what a rich history that America has. <coughs> Excuse me. Sitting on one of the British ships was an American lawyer. His name was Francis Scott Keyes. Uh, he had just negotiated with the British the release of a prisoner that they held, that they were in, in fact going to execute. Uh, but he, he got him released, but he wasn't allowed to leave himself because he had become aware what the British were about to do. They were about to invade the harbour of uh, Baltimore and they were about to fire on Fort McHenry. They didn't want anybody warned of what was going to happen, so uh, he was kept with the British all night, and all night he sat watching uh, the cannons exploding over the fort and the sky lighting up and the smoke everywhere and lighting up, and, and he saw all of this hoping during the night that it wouldn't go silent, because if it did go silent, it would mean that the British had actually captured that fort and that would be a major battleground in that war. But uh, the next morning, the British did stop, but it wasn't because they had taken the fort. It was because they had run out of ammunition or were running out of ammunition and their attempts to take that fort had, had failed. And in one of the most patriotic scenes in American history, Francis Scott Keyes looks out and sees a huge American flag being raised over that fort. And the American soldiers to his incredible relief have held their ground and in his great relief for their perseverance Keyes wrote a poem about the defeat uh, about the defense of Fort McHenry that poem was later put to the music of an old pub song and ended up being sung over and over and over again by millions of Americans who shared in that relief and in a very patriotic way. You know what that song is, right? Star Spangled Banner. Yeah, adopted as America's national anthem. I, I wonder if you, as Americans, even when you hear that story told, even when you hear that, that you already know, most of you, I, I, I wonder if you sense and, and feel the relief that Francis Scott Keyes would have felt, I wonder if you feel that when you sing that song every time you hear that story um, and every time you sing it. I, I'm talking to Americans today, I am, but here's the reality if you know anything about me. You know before I'm ever talking to Americans, I'm talking to Christians whenever I talk to people in this church. If you even get 
a small sense, even a small sense of the relief of Francis Scott Keyes, if you can sense that, I want you to consider something exponentially greater today. So I'm asking Americans, of which I'm one, to understand something that gives great relief is nothing in compared to something that gives exponentially greater relief. Are you with me? I want you to sense the relief today of the Apostle Paul. As uh, much as we love our country, brothers and sisters, the truth is nations come and go, and even this one. And, you know, the sense of relief you hear from Paul today is for the eternal preservation of God's church. It's, it's a huge relief. And the truth uh, that we're going to read is, is this sense of relief that Paul has in this. Now, we can have relief in so many things. Uh, you, you're right, we can have relief that a, a nation is spared from defeat. We can have relief in sim- things that seem more trivial in respect to that. I know there are parents that ha- would have relief that their children pass college and get a job. I know that uh, there would be relief that their children just get a job. Or you might have uh, relief of paying out the mortgage or paying out a car loan, the relief of a cured, being cured from an illness. But Christians brothers and sisters, know that there is nothing like the relief that we have in the grace of Christ, the forgiveness of sins, God's preserving hand on his church, taking us all the way to glory. That, that is just huge. And as a church, I want us to get a sense of this today. So here's what I want to put to you today as we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Our great relief and joy comes as we see God preserving his church in faith and love. Our great relief and joy comes from God, as we see God preserve his church in faith and love. Now, last week we had the opposite of relief, and that's uh, something that I really want us to remember, because last week we heard anxiety. Do you remember hearing anxiety? Godly anxiety. Paul was really anxious Paul knew that the Thessalonians had faced affliction and were constantly facing affliction and he was really concerned about where they were at. And so we read the words twice in the first five five verses, I could bear it or we could bear it no longer. There was just incredible anxiety. I could not bear any more not knowing if this church is okay. So they sent Timothy back to strengthen and encourage them in the faith so that they would not be moved in their faithfulness by affliction by the affliction they face. So that was, that was anxiety. Uh, there's a big turnaround from verse 5 to verse 6, where we start this morning. And this big turnaround is, uh, is, is now the, re- the result of Timothy's visit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. So Paul is getting this good news of relief now. It's gone from anxiety to relief, this good news of relief of their perseverance in faith and love. And, and we're going to start this morning with love because that's what he kind of explains first and so uh, I I want to explain some things around it but then we'll get to looking at love so we have relief when the church exhibits the love and unity of the gospel look at the first two words in verse six but now but now so when Timothy brought this news back to Paul everything changed but now And in fact, I want to put to you that the whole letter that we are reading in 1 Thessalonians, all all five chapters, the whole letter really uh, is written from Paul's sense of relief and thankfulness for this church and for what God has done in keeping them as a faithful church. Now, it's not a perfect church. It's an ordinary church. They're ordinary Christians, but they are faithful Christians nonetheless. And so we're looking at this little section, verses 6 onwards this morning, uh, to the end of the chapter. And uh, really this little section today epitomizes the whole letter. We've seen lots of thankfulness for Paul. And and now we're going into a section later where Paul's going to deal with some things that they need some correction and strengthening in. 
And really, this is, this is a little section of this letter that just describes the whole letter, like what we get in 1 Thessalonians. So what we've had is Timothy, he's describing what happened. I was worried about you. I was anxious about you. We sent Timothy back to you. Timothy has come back now with a report, and he's given us a report that talks about two major points of relief for Paul. There's the good news of this church's faith and the good news of this church's love good news of your faith and love. That's what we see in verse 6. Now, if you skip down to verse 7, just look at verse 7 for a moment, you'll notice that Paul also says that for the reason, for the reason that they have been comforted, they've been comforted. That's the, the change in Paul. So, but now, because of what's come to us from Timothy, comfort. So he's gone from concern to comfort, from anxiety to relief, and this is now being, being described, his relief. And it's because he received good news from Timothy. I know that Paul really is pretty simply saying that he's, he's received good comforting news. I'm, I'm happy about the news that I've received. But you know what? Here's what I can't look over. Paul uses a very specific word in the way that he describes that he's received good news. And that word that he uses is, I've received a proclamation of good news. The original uh, language, it's the word uh, euangelizo, which is the proclamation of good news. It's the, it's the word that we use for gospel. The proclamation of the gospel, it's good news. And, and he's saying that he wants us to understand that there's an, a sense of relief in the news that he is getting, that is the same sense of relief that you get from understanding the gospel. It's that good news. It's the gospel. It's it's like gospel news. Now, um, I know how Paul's using it, but I think it's also intentional that he's using this language. Let's not forget here something as we think about this. The, the, the good news Paul is now getting is the very reflection it's the very reflection of the good news that he had originally brought to them because there's a sense of relief in it. Um, you know there has to be relief in good news, don't you? Right? Otherwise, it's just news, isn't it? Okay? You're here this morning. That's just news. But you're, you're here this morning because you're not somewhere else doing something with pagans ignoring God. That would be bad news. There's a sense of relief that you're here this morning. Okay? That's, that's good news because there's relief in it. That relief that, that they know, that these, these Thessalonians know, they know relief from the good news about Jesus that was brought to them and it's such relief they're able to stand in that good news in the face of affliction because nothing else will bring them relief like this good news. That's what true relief of the gospel does. Now, before we really start getting into how Paul sees the love and unity in this church, I just want to divert just for one moment. I know it's not the main point of the text today, but I just want to say this to us as we just look at this word that's in the text. I, 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 let's not, brothers and sisters, when we, when we hear about the relief of the gospel, and Paul is getting a sense of relief of the gospel too. It's a relief of the gospel in the lives of the Thessalonians, and they've had the relief of the gospel itself. Let, please, can we understand something? Let's not ever expect to see people walking solidly in their faith if we preach a gospel that is void of relief. Please, let's think about that. Because the, the only reason that any of us in this room can know the relief of the gospel is if you actually know the reality of God's righteous judgment on sin. You know what brings you relief, what you are relieved from. That, that relief is only substantial when we know that God's judgment is actually eternal. It, it gets bigger, doesn't it? Eternal relief. You know and can only know relief when you realize that there is actually nothing, there's absolutely nothing you can do to save yourself from the wrath of a holy God. Nothing. That's relief. You can only know relief when you know that there is actually no other substitute for you than Jesus, who has no sin of his own, who can substitute himself to pay our unpayable debt. That brings relief. And there's only no relief that we can know that 
we've been reconciled to God because he has actually accepted, the Father has accepted the payment of the Son for our sin. And when you know that relief, there is no amount of affliction, no amount of accusation, no amount of oppression or opposition that can rob you of that relief in your life. That relief is the greatest relief. There's no other relief like it. And Paul is relieved that the Thessalonians know and live in that relief. He's relieved in the gospel in the Thessalonians. Now, Paul is specifically saying here that that relief comes in two identifiable ways. So, it's the good news of their faith, of your faith and love. And it's reported to you. And when, then he says it's reported to you. So he's now going to start describing the faith and love. But when you see what he first reports, he's reporting love. It's reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. Do you see that? So he's not immediately talking about their faith. He's immediately talking about their love. They love Paul and Timothy and Silas. They have gospel love. Now, you could look at this statement from Paul and you might easily mistake it for just some sentimentality. Hey, listen, um, you know, you long to see us and you remember us kindly. You remember us fondly. It's like what we say to people on the phone. You know, hey, you know, I've got fond memories of such and such and it's kind of sentimental and, and that's not this. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is talking, using these words in a very particular context that we see in the whole letter. Let's remember what Paul had to do. Paul had to abruptly leave Thessalonica with Timothy and Silas because of persecution. And this church is now suffering on an ongoing basis under the attacks from their community that are against them and their accusations against Paul's ministry to them. Paul has already had to defend that. We saw that in chapter 2. So that's the context. Now think about what Paul is hearing knowing that there's been massive attacks and accusations against the ministry of the gospel that has been brought to these people, they could be thinking, yeah, look, where's Paul? He's gone. If, if they listen to the community around them, he's gone. Who is he to us? This is not authentic. This is, we're left with this. They're not thinking that. They have not listened to a word of slander about their Christian brother. They have a generous, kind spirit toward Paul and Timothy and Silas. They long to see them as much as Paul and Timothy and Silas long to see them. And you know what? Please hear this. That kind of love, that kind of steadfast love that doesn't get swayed by the accusations of the world, that kind of love, brothers and sisters... That can only be explained by people who understand the infinite love of the gospel that they've received from Christ. Now, I want to sit on this just for a little bit, okay? Because I think Paul is specifically speaking about a love that is not hindered by the world's slander, because we have it all around us. That their love for Paul withstood all the false accusations about him and his ministry. And I think there's a great display of these attributes, these specific attributes of love in the gospel that we read in the list of attributes of love that we find in 1 Corinthians 13. Turn to me there, there with me, would you? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 7. You know these words well. If you've been to any wedding, you've probably heard them read. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things things i want to put to you particularly that last verse in verse 7 in first corinthians 13 i think that's on direct display in this church toward paul and it's because of christ love bears all things love believes all things it hopes all things so i i think this typifies love 
in a church, brothers and sisters, that's the way that love should be as we think about each other, as we approach each other, as we consider each other, as we hear about things about each other, right? We love each other in a way that we continually believe the best about each other. Do you see that in those words? If we're in Christ, listen, this is, 1 Corinthians is written to a Christian church, right? This is not just written to outsiders. This is not written to those who are not in Christ. This is about how we understand love within the body of Christ. And we truly can understand that love in the body of Christ. And because, because we lo- love each other in a way that we continue, continually believe the best about each other, why? Because this is gospel love. This is love that knows that your brother and sister has come to Christ. They're in Christ. And it understands the infinite sacrificial love of Christ for them in salvation. It, we believe that Christ is working in them. We can have a hope and a belief about other Christians in a way that we can't think about non-Christians because of Christ, right? That's why that our first inclination when we are thinking about Christian brothers and sisters must always be to believe the best, to believe the best, to hope all things, bear all things, believe all things. That's our first indicator. Look, I know we're sinners. I know we can let each other down. I know that that can happen. And we we need to be vulnerable that way because we're commanded by love to be here first and then believe that even if somebody leads us wrongly or, or lets us down, that because Christ is in them, because of this love, it can be put right. Mercy can be given because Christ gave us mercy. It's the love that these believers have from the gospel. It won't allow them to be distracted by the slander of the world because their love for their brother in Christ bears and believes and hopes and endures in Christ. My first inclination about you, brothers and sisters, is never to be a negative, cynical view. It is to be a hope and a belief that Christ is working in you. I think it's really, really important. Do you you know what I'm always blown away by? Why did Paul ever bother to write the first letter to the church at Corinth? Why? Think about the church at Corinth. Just think about that for a moment, okay? It's a pretty yucky church. Like, there were some ugly things happening, don't you think? Ugly things. Divisions, immorality... Uh, gloating over sin, greed, lawsuits, struggles for ascendancy. That doesn't sound good. And you read the letter and you see all of that, but then go back and, and look at Paul's introduction to this letter to the, to the Corinthian church, his, his introduction to this first letter. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 to 6. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. How on earth can he write that? How can he write that? Because he can write that because if this church is in Christ... He can believe the best about them in the way that they will hear his correction, repent of their sin, and honor the Lord. And because of Paul's love, he approaches a really messy church that repents and changes. Go and read 2 Corinthians, and you'll see a change. Because because of that, the, the, the Christian love, gospel love, that's confidence in each other because we have confidence in Christ, and that's exactly why that this church is loving Paul. Are you hearing that? Are you hearing that? I... It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's our first impression of every Christian at, that we meet. It's, our, it's the way that we deal with each other on an ongoing basis. But Timothy talks of the good news of love, but not just that, of faith and love. And so we move into faith. And secondly, I want to put to you that we are relieved when, we, when the church exhibits steadfast faith. Look at verse 7 and 8 with me. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction... We have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. So Paul, even in the, in, in the midst of his own distress and affliction, has been comforted about their faith. And Paul is writing this letter 
probably from Corinth. So they've gone from Thessalonica to Berea to Athens and now in Corinth. You read about that in Acts chapter 18. And let me tell you, Paul in Corinth was undergoing some of his own hardships. He talks about his all our distress and affliction. It's, it, it could mean a number of other things, this distress and affliction, but it could also mean the, the, the distress and affliction that he's facing right there and then in Corinth as he's hearing this news and writing a letter back to Thessalonica. And, and he did. If you read Acts 18, you'll read that Jews from the synagogue uh, in Corinth were attacking Paul in front of the Roman proconsul, and then they brought him before the Jewish tribunal. Listen, don't we know that Paul was always, always standing in front of opposition, wasn't he? Just happened on an ongoing basis. But the point of what Paul is, is bring, bringing us here is that what he has received in the midst of affliction, in the midst of his own affliction, has brought him incredible relief and comfort. And so the Thessalonians' steadfast faith is what allows him to have comfort in the midst of affliction. This church, the report that came back from Timothy, he went there because Paul was worried that they would be moved in, by their affliction. And Timothy comes back and says, Paul, they're actually not moved by the affliction. They're standing fast in the Lord. They're standing strong, Paul. You have no need to be anxious anymore. And what is amazing here is how Paul explains his relief and comfort and encouragement in verse 8. Look at verse 8 really carefully. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Some of us are like that with coffee. Aren't we? Get up in the morning, don't know how I'm going to make it through the day, go to your espresso machine, make your first cappuccino, that's what I do. Ah, uh, now I can live. And you would say to me, you are being ridiculously overdramatic, Stephen. Of course you can live. You, that's silly. We're talking about a caffeine substance. Get over it. You know, that's, that's just overdramatic. I want to put to you that Paul is not being overdramatic. It's got nothing to do with overdramatic comments like that. He's making an intense comment. It's intense. It's intensely real what he is feeling. It's the intensity, all the intensity that he can muster because in the circumstance of his own distress and affliction, he is hearing news about Thessalonians that is like life-giving air. I can breathe again. He hears it and it's like the, it's like the, the breath of, of life in him. That, that's how much he loves the church. That's how much he cares for the church, cares for the souls of the church. That when he finds out that someone is standing fast in the Lord, he can breathe. Wow. It's not just about distant friends. People that I know that are in Thessalonica. It's about the way Paul always sees his Christian brothers and sisters and I think the way he sees anybody, but, but really the way he sees them in, in relation to Christ, he sees not just distant friends, he sees the eternal souls of those he loves. The eternal souls of those he loves. And, and, and by the way, I, I want you to look at those words carefully again because it says, um, for now we live if, you see that word there, if you are standing fast in the faith. Now, it, it, that can actually be translated as the word since, if or since. I, I want to say that it probably has that, more of that type of reflection here. We can live since you are standing fast in the faith. We can live because we know that. That's, that's a true relief that Paul has in a church that is truly that he, what he's saying is, I, you've truly come to saving faith. You're not being led astray by the world. You're standing firm. You're, you're there. 
despite opposition, you're there, you're showing me that it's actually real, that your faith is actually real. They're standing in faith, authentic, persevering faith. Ah, I can live, I can breathe. What a relief. Some of you are parents in this room. I'm a parent. I can immediately sympathize, just like you. Because Paul has had anxiety and relief, whatever the saving faith of the church. I know what it is to have the anxiety about where the child is standing. And I know what it is to have the relief about where a child is walking in the Lord. If you're a parent, you know that. And it's intense, isn't it? It's intense. And that's what Paul sees, sees these people as like, like his children. Imagine if we had this type of intensity of anxiety and relief for everybody we know, especially the ongoing faithfulness of the church. Imagine if that was us. So when you read Paul's other letters, just go and read them. Um, I think you hear it regularly in Paul. He might not always say, you know, it in these words, now I can live. But you often hear Paul in his letters saying, hey, your faith, the fact that you're standing in your faith has, he'll use words like, it's refreshed me. It's refreshed me. And that's a priority of understanding, by the way. It's a priority in the importance of an eternal soul. And I want us to really understand that. Because brothers and sisters... I'm, I'm thankful that we've got baby bear underneath here that is, is operating and doing what it's doing. I'm thankful when I see a mum and dad coming and getting some of the needed supplies from baby bear. I'm thankful when we supply them. There's a box out there. Great. Please do it. It's encouraging. It really is. Please hear me on this. It, it's not even comparable to the hope that I have the anxiety that I have to hear that one has come to Christ and is walking in the faith and love in eternal hope because these are not just mums and dads, these are eternal souls. Paul doesn't have relief about the temporal, he has relief about the eternal when he thinks of the church or otherwise. Now I'm not trying to be intense, I'm trying to have the same priority focus as Jesus gave the apostles. This is just the focus that they have. It's the focus the whole church ought to have. It ought to prioritize our motivations with everyone in our life. And when Paul hears that his beloved brothers and sisters are standing in the Lord, you, you then hear him just gush. He just gushes out in the prayer of thanksgiving of what, for what God has done. And so lastly, let's look at this. We can be overjoyed to know that God will perfect his imperfect church. Look at verses 9 to 11 with me. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly, night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. I want to suggest to you something. First Thessalonians 3.9. Look at the verse 9 there for a moment. It's, it, it, this verse, I think, everybody in this room should use for what our response should be when we hear people coming up and giving testimonies when, when they get baptised and, and, and things like that in our church. I think verse 9 typifies how we should respond. These brothers and sisters, when people come up and get baptised and often, not always, but often give testimonies here, you know, uh, I want to just say to you, they're not just inspiring stories to encourage us. That's not, the, that's not the point of them. They are the displays of the infinite saving grace of God on undeserving rebellious creatures. That's why Paul doesn't thank the Thessalonians. And in fact, I want to tell you, in this sentence... He's thanking God, but he's, it's, he also doesn't express that he's actually thanking God. He, he is, though, in a much bigger way. He, look, look at the words he uses. He asks a question about his thanksgiving to God. What thanksgiving can we return to God for you? 
for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? Question mark. In other words, how on earth can I ever return to God? He means repay. How on earth can I ever repay God in thanksgiving for the joy he gives me because of his work of grace in you? How, how, how? Imagine somebody saying that to you after, after you're giving a testimony. <laughs> Imagine saying that to someone. I don't even know how to thank God for this. This is, this is amazing. Who speaks like this? Like we look at this, you know, who speaks like that? Right? It's not, it's not something that we just initially do. Why does he speak like this? Why, why is the ordinary, authentic faith of a Thessalonian Christian worth this seemingly to us overstated response? Like there's nothing earth shattering. They're believing in Jesus and standing in Jesus. We expect everybody to do that. There's nothing earth shattering that has happened. They're just living true to the profession of their faith. It doesn't show us anything simply earth shattering. Well, that's true. That's because somebody standing in the normal, ordinary profession of their faith in true faithfulness to God in salvation isn't just earth shattering. Brothers and sisters, it's hell shattering. It's way beyond earth shattering. It's huge. See, there's no possible repayment we can make to God for his grace, whether it's in us or another. And so what Paul is really saying here is that he has this unending, limitless expression of gratitude to God because it can only be unending and limitless because that's the only way any of us can respond to someone standing in faith. Why? Because it's all of God and all of grace. It's on display in them. Let me ask you a question. You who've been in our church for a long time, or even a little time, have you not looked around our church and seen some evidence of faithfulness and love in God's grace, in Grace and Truth Cincinnati? Have you not seen some evidence of that? I'm not talking perfect, right? We're imperfect. We're messy sometimes. We don't all get it right. But when you see it, I see it often. What does it mean to you that this is the display of God's grace and glory right in front of your face? Right in front of your face. What, what does that do to your gratitude meter? Do you have one? <laughs> Does it, it should go like that, just huge. And so that's a reminder, I think, that we need to regularly give ourselves. And, and then Paul's thanksgiving morphs into his prayer for them. Look at how it morphs for them. And it's motivated by all of this thanksgiving and love for them, this relief in his life. And look at what he earnestly, he says, earnestly prays constantly, night and day. And he prays this, that he would be with them face to face. That 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 God would direct our way to you. He wants to be with them. And, and his consistent prayer is that he would, in thankfulness for this church, come to them knowing that this church still doesn't have all of their ducks in a row. He needs to, to go and, and God needs to use him to supply what is lacking, lacking. He can love a church that is lacking. Can you love a church that is lacking like that? They're not perfect. They have space to, to grow, they have lack, but his prayer is that God would use him to help them and he's relying on God to get him to them and supply what they need, but he's also showing in here, in this whole context, that he has this really sincere passion that he wants to be with them. And so there's a couple of things I want to note before we finish. Firstly, firstly, that is Paul is praying to go to them. He wants God to direct his path to them. 
and give them some real pastoral care and discipleship where they need it. And so if you look at verse 11, he prays, and he prays to both Father and Son. Please note that, because he's praying to Father and Son as God and Lord, all right? In the same category, Jesus is God. We see that even here. He's praying to the Father and the Son as God and Lord, and he's praying to his God and Lord, asking to direct his way to them. Now, if you remember in chapter 2, Paul said that Satan was hindering him from coming to them. Well, Satan can do what he's like, but now he's praying to God to direct his way to them. And Paul sees the real importance of being with them, with, with them, immediately, present in love and care. Just, just think about what we've seen when we were talking about Paul's anxiety, about were they okay, that we dealt with last week. And now we're looking at Paul's incredible relief that he doesn't even know how to thank God for, in them being standing fast in the Lord and, and in love and unity with him. And Paul's heart in all of the words around this are constantly on display. There, he has this beautiful, passionate love for the church. This sounds like a broken record from me. I know it does. I, if you think it sounds a broken record from me, just see that it's not a broken record in the text, okay? Because I'm just preaching the text. But what I want us to see here is that there is nothing clinical about the way Paul does ministry. Nothing clinical. Uh, so it's, it's not authoritarian. He could use that, he's an apostle. It's not, it's not just authoritarian or directional, it's not just informational. It's intimate, it's loving, it's familial. He's told them he's like a nursing mother and a, and a caring father. It's abounding in love. It's friendly. I say this because I know that I'm not the only pastor in the world who has been warned by somebody else, even a pastor, not to make really close friends with people in the church that you pastor. Joe, jo, did anybody ever say something like that? Yes, see? And I bet you Jeremy's heard it as well. Be careful, don't make too close of friends with the people that you, that, that you pastor in the church. Read Paul. What rubbish. That's a direct contradiction to the intimacy of pastoral ministry seen in Paul. Listen, would you hear me really carefully? I think I speak for all of the elders here. You are our closest loving friends. I love this quote that comes from commentator Gordon Fee. I read it this week and I just about bounced out of my chair in celebration. Just listen to this. He says, talking about these verses, Paul here exhibits none of the aloofness that has often characterized what has come to be called Christian ministry, which seems too often to short, fall short of the apost apostolic kind. What he's saying, and amen to that, is that apostolic ministry is friendly, familial ministry that has the most de intimate, deep love that you could possibly have. And we minister to each other that way. There is nothing clinical. That's why we do biblical counselling and not therapy in this church. There is nothing clinical in what we do. Secondly, not only is Paul's ministry not clinical, the love that Paul has for this church it's not diminished by the fact that this church still needs some help and correction. They have lack. They have lacking. And so his love motivates his desire for God to use him in a way that he loves and cares for them by providing what they need. It comes from God, but he's the means. And so right there is this type of pastoral eldership ministry that we must grow and maintain in our church, brothers and sisters. And our eldership, I want to tell you, really want to be accountable to that, to, about that to each other and to you that we have this type of ministry, that motivated by love, we want to come alongside you in whatever you're going through. Whatever you come to us with, it doesn't matter. Whatever lacking there is, we're going to count it a loving privilege to jump into whatever mud you're in with you. With you. Whatever it is. 
We're going to count it a blessing, a privilege to walk with you through it as we seek God to supply whatever is lacking. Please don't be embarrassed. Please don't think you're going to be shocking us. Please don't any of that. Come to us because we love you and we want to walk with you through it. Whatever you think it is, every reason that is in your head right now, I can't talk to the pastors about this. Throw it out. We love you and we want to walk in the mud with you. We want to supply by God what is lacking. Why? Because your eternal soul is worth everything to us. Now, as we finish, we, we need to finish right now, really quickly. You can ask what is lacking. We get it in verse 12 and 13. What is lacking? Well, it seems that they need to grow and abound in love for each other and for all. There's one thing. Two, uh, in verse 13... They may have their hearts established in blamelessness and in holiness before our God and Father and at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. So verse 11, there's a way in which they need to grow in love. Verse 12, there's a way that they need to, uh, uh, verse 12, they need to grow in love. Verse 13, there, there's a way that they need to have their hearts blameless. Now, blameless is before mankind and holy, that's before God. They need to walk with blameless and holy hearts that's their thinking, their volition, their will, their desires, those sorts of things. The way that they need to grow in that. And then in verse 13, in doing that, they need to do it in a way that they prepare for the return of Jesus. They need to do more to, repair, to, to understand the right understanding of the return of Jesus and preparing for that day. Now, the next event in the church calendar, always for Paul, is the return of Christ in judging the living and the dead. That's the next event you always see in Paul getting them ready for the day when Jesus returns with his saints or, or more literally, holy ones. Now, we don't need to consider that any further today and there's a reason, is because what Paul has just described, he now goes through point by point in chapters four and five. So we're going to that from next week. Let me, let me conclude. Think now for a minute of the relief of the heart of Francis Scott Keyes seeing the flag raised over Fort McHenry after the British onslaught all night that everybody sings before baseball matches. Brothers and sisters, I hope you can see a difference. The, the relief of a flag over Fort McHenry that we sing about or the relief of a church standing strong in the relief of the gospel. That's a difference, isn't it? Do you see that difference? Look, I'm not just uh, illustrate. I'm, it, it, what I'm really doing, I'm illustrating an uncomparable difference, knowing that someone is actually living authentically in Christ compared to anything else in this world. That's the difference between the patriotism of a flag, which is really big for a lot of people, and, and this difference, the inability of an apostle to even know, even have the words to know how to repay God in thankfulness for his grace. Compared to the relief of the gospel, everything else is minuscule in comparison. Do you realize what Paul is saying that we can have relief and joy in? Just look at these words from Matthew chapter 16. Talking to Peter, he says, I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And what is Jesus doing? He's building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But what about this work that Jesus is doing in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 that we've heard before? I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Does that verse give you relief? Is that the most good, glorious relief that you could ever have? And Paul says, I need to be with you and helping you. And all of this says this, it says... It, it, it says that we need each other. It says that the church is vitally important. It says that we only persevere and grow as we trust and rely together with, on Christ. On Christ, We have something so important that we must care, protect and care for in the church. And we must never be clinical in our ministry to each other. And it lastly tells us that the most important community preserved in the world is the church. And praise God, he's done it for 2,000 years. Our great relief and joy comes as we see God 
preserving his church in faith and love. Let's pray.